What's up, I'm Vin, and today I want to look at the alternating series test. So here's the actual alternating series test, and we'll use this to go through a few examples. Now the concept behind why the alternating series test works is that when we're adding and subtracting positive things, and the things that we're adding and subtracting are getting smaller and smaller, so B sub N is decreasing. And also along the way, not only are our terms getting smaller, but the limit as N goes to infinity of B sub N is equal to zero, that means we're going to be going forward and backwards by smaller and smaller amounts. And the amounts that we're going forward and backwards by are eventually going to shrink to zero until we zigzag ever so slightly here until we get to S, which is the actual sum of our alternating series. So this is just something that is helpful to visualize to help you make sense of the alternating series test. So now let's look at a few examples where we try to show if the series converges or diverges. Now for this first example here, the first thing that jumps out at me is that we have an alternating series because we have a negative one to the n plus one attached. And this piece over here to the right, one thing you have to look out for, a very dangerous trap to this question, is if you look at n squared over n to the third plus four, if you only consider the leading terms n squared over n to the third, this simplifies to one over n. And someone who's not careful will think of this series and say, oh, that's the harmonic series and it diverges. But because this is an alternating series, this entire series is actually going to converge. So the alternating series test, what we have to do is define B sub n. And B sub n is always the piece next to negative one to the n plus one or negative one to the n. So in this case, B sub n is n squared over n to the third plus four. So now we just have to show two things. We have an alternating series. We have to show that the limit as n goes to infinity of B sub n is equal to zero. And if we just analyze this, we have a rational function here. So we have a polynomial on top and bottom. The denominator has a higher power than the numerator. So that tells us our limit is gonna to go to zero. So once again, if the degree of the denominator is greater than the degree of the numerator and you're going to infinity, your limit's gonna equal zero. So that's one condition met. But then the next thing we have to be able to show here is that this sequence is decreasing. Now for this first example, I'm not gonna go through the most rigorous explanation as to why this is decreasing. But one thing that jumps out at me with this as to why this is gonna be a decreasing sequence is because the denominator, I'll abbreviate that, increases at a faster rate. So this is a really big idea. So the denominator increases at a faster rate, which tells us if the denominator is increasing faster than the numerator, then our fraction is gonna be getting smaller. And if our fraction is getting smaller over time, then this sequence is going to be decreasing on its way from one to infinity. So as we plug in terms from one to infinity. So now we just have to state it formally here. We'll say that the sequence of terms n squared over n to the third plus four. So this sequence is a decreasing sequence. So now once we state those two things that the limit as n goes to infinity of our B sub n sequence is going to zero and our sequence of terms is decreasing, now we can use our conclusion here that by the alternating series test, our original series converges. So for this question here, these sometimes throw people off because of the cosine n pi. But the best thing you could do with a question like this is plug in and then try to rewrite this in terms of a different series. So if we plug in one, we're going to have cosine of one pi over and we would have one to the three fourths. But then the goal here is to be to, to look for a pattern. Then we have plus cosine of two pi over two to the three fourths. And we'll do a few more until we get the idea, but cosine of three pi over three to the three fourths. And then this will go on and on. But notice if we plug in, this is gonna give us, we would first have one pi is equal to negative, oh, cosine of one pi is negative one. So we'd have negative one over one to the three fourths power. And then we'd have plus cosine of two pi is positive one over two to the three fourths. And then we'd have minus one over three to the three fourths. So we might start to see the trend here. The next one will be plus one over four to the three fourths. So we could rewrite this as a new series and we'll use the same exact, you know, going from n equals one to infinity. But now we have to be careful about this. On top, we have negative one to the n power. And notice this thing starts negative. So negative one to the first is definitely gonna match up with this first term here. But then on bottom, notice what we have is we have n 
to the three-fourths power like this. Okay, so uh, take a second. You could uh, verify this here, but notice if we start at n equals 1, it's going to give us the first term. n equals 2 should give us the second term here, and so on. So anytime you get like a cosine n pi, or sometimes you get like a sine n, uh, uh, like a sine like 2m plus 1 times pi over 2, so you get the odd values of, like, you know, so you get a bunch of values like this, like sine pi over 2, sine 3 pi over 2, and so on. So anytime you get something that gives you a bunch of these, the best thing you could do is write it in terms of negative 1, 1, negative 1, 1, and then rewrite it in terms of a simpler series. So now this is going to be the one that we actually want to work with, that our original series is equal to this. So then if we look here, we could say this time b sub n is equal to 1 over n to the 3 fourths power. And from this step, now we just have to do our analysis. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n to the 3 fourths power this is going to go to zero because the thought process, technically we shouldn't write one over infinity, but this is going to one over infinity to the three fourths, which is heading towards infinity and one divided by infinity heads to zero. So one of the conditions is met, but now if we think about the sequence of terms, one over n to the three fourths power, if we look at this, this is a decreasing sequence. Okay, so remember when you're using the alternating series test, it's very important that you make mention here that your sequence of terms is decreasing. So this is a decreasing sequence. And one other skill, if it's not 100% obvious yet, when you're identifying your b sub n term, your b sub n term is everything except the negative one to the n or the negative one to the n plus one. Okay, so that's like a really, really, really big idea for these questions. Notice if we flip back to the previous example for a moment, b sub n was the extra piece after the negative one to the n plus one. So once again, when we're defining b sub n, it's the piece that's not negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1. So now that we said all we needed to, we found the limit of b sub n to be 0 as n goes to infinity, and we said that we have a decreasing sequence. Now we could say by the alternating series test that the original series converges. So for this next question here, right away I look at this and I think, all right, b sub n is n over natural log n. But one of the real big ideas you need for n versus natural log n is that you have to notice that n versus natural log n, n increases at a faster rate than natural log of n. One way I like to convince students of that is I think about the graph of y equals x versus the graph of y equals natural log x. The graph of y equals x is just this, and we'll make it neat here. So we'll just rewrite this part. But y equals x is just this diagonal line like this. Whereas natural log x looks something like this. So I think it's clear that y equals x versus natural log x, that y equals x takes off. And the rate of change of y equals x is constant. It's equal to 1. So this is just going up 1 over 1 forever whereas the rate of change of natural log x is 1 over x. So as time goes on, as x increases, the rate of change slows down here and it flattens out. So in a sense, I think about this as n is more powerful than natural log of n. So I automatically jump to this step, that the limit as n goes to infinity of n over natural log n goes to infinity. Now, if it's not obvious, what you could do is you could use L'Hopital's rule, because this, if you think about it, is an infinity over infinity limit. The top and bottom are going to infinity, but at different speeds. So if we apply L'Hopital's rule, we could see here the derivative of the stuff on top is 1, while the derivative of the thing on bottom is 1 over n. So then this just becomes the limit as n goes to infinity of n, which goes to infinity. So this tells us here right away that the alternating series test is not going to apply. But the task for all of these questions was to determine if the series converges or diverges. So since the b sub n piece went to infinity, what we could do is we could use the nth term test for divergence. So we could take the limit as n goes to infinity of the entire term inside of our series here, the sum end. So we take negative 1 to the n, n over natural log n. And notice here that this particular limit does not exist because this piece is going to infinity and this one is bouncing back and forth between 1 and negative 1. So we could say that this limit does not exist. 
And because this limit does not exist, that tells us right away that the original series is going to diverge. So remember, for the n term test, it's a very big idea that if the limit as n goes to infinity of the general term is not zero, you could automatically say that the series diverges. And that's what's going on here. This limit is non-zero because it does not exist. So looking at question four, right again, I'm thinking the same thing. The first thing that jumps in my head here is that I take the limit of the b sub n term. So I take the limit as n goes to infinity of 3n minus 1 over 2n plus 1 and see that this limit is equal to 3 halves, which I note right away is not equal to 0. So what that tells me is that if the limit of b sub n is not equal to 0, then I'd rather switch here and say this is going to diverge, but we have to use the nth term test for divergence, which means next we have to include the negative 1 to the n inside of our limit. Because here, when we look at the entire thing, this limit does not exist. Because if this limit goes to 3 halves, negative 1 to the n makes this bounce back and forth between plus or minus 3 halves. So this limit does not exist. So once again, by the nth term test for divergence, the series is going to diverge. For the last question here, we're going to define b sub n to be the term not attached to negative 1 to the n. So that's going to be sine of pi over n. And now, the first part should be not so bad. The limit as n goes to infinity step is definitely simpler than the next part. So we're taking the limit as n goes to infinity of the b sub n term. And now here, what we could think about, if we could do this in our head and see that pi over n is going to go to 0 as n increases to infinity. Otherwise, if you want to break this up and use the composition of functions idea, this is the same thing as taking sine of the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n. And this limit, once again, is heading towards 0 because we would have, if we think about it, we'd have pi over infinity, and a number divided by infinity shrinks to 0. So this would be sine of 0, and sine of 0 is equal to 0. So that condition checks out. Now, this next part, we want to say that b sub n is a decreasing sequence. So it may not be so obvious that sine of pi over n from 1 to infinity eventually will just keep decreasing. So we'll explore that a little bit more because um, that's something we want to be 100% sure of. So if we look at f of x equals sine of pi over x. The best way we could determine if a function is increasing or decreasing is by looking at the derivative. So let me just make that a little bit neater. So we have sine of pi over x. So if we look at this derivative, f prime of x equals cosine of pi over x. So we're using the chain rule here. We use the derivative of the outside. You keep the inside. And then the derivative of pi over x is negative pi over x squared. Okay, this you could just call pi x to the negative 1 and do the power rule and then rearrange it so it looks like this. So there's our derivative. And notice we're on the interval from 1 to infinity for this series. So when we analyze our derivative, we're only going to be analyzing this from 1 to infinity. So what I would want to do is find the root here or find all the roots that are possible. So if you set cosine of pi over x equal to 0, and keep in mind, we're on the interval from 1 to infinity. Well, what we could find here is that cosine of pi over x is equal to 0, specifically when x is equal to 2. And the thought process here is that cosine of pi over 2 is equal to 0. So pi over x equals pi over 2 when x is equal to 2. So that is our only critical point here. Now, we might be thinking, like, how do we know there's no more critical points after 1 except 2? Well, if you think about the cosine function in the unit circle, some ideas to consider is that these are the significant values of cosine. Cosine of pi over 2 is 0, then 3 pi over 2. Then we would have, after this, we'd have 5 pi over 2, and so on like this. But the problem is, is that the x is in the denominator. So the only way to make something like pi over x equal 3 pi over 2, well, for something like this, we could cross out. And then this would give us x equals 2 thirds. And if I had to say what value of x for pi over x would give us 
5 pi over 2, it would be x equals 2 fifths, and so on. So we have a lot of values that are less than 1 that would give us critical points, but we're only looking from 1 to infinity. So that's just a minor detail here that we have to be mindful of. So we'll just get this out of the way, and now we'll continue this question. So now what we could do is we could plug in test values into here. And one thing to be mindful of is the negative pi over x squared piece. This is always negative. So this is always negative. So I'm only going to plug into the cosine pi over x and then just say if this is positive times a negative, it's going to work out to something negative. So here I would look at x equals, let's say, 1.5, which is equal to 3 over 2. If we plugged in 3 over 2, notice that would give us cosine of pi over 3 over 2, which would work out to 2 pi over 3. And notice this is a quadrant 2 angle. So this is something to be mindful of here. We have cosine of 2 pi over 3, which is basically 120 degrees. And in quadrant 2, only sine is positive. Cosine is negative. So we would have something negative times something that's always negative, which would work out to something positive. So now if we plug in something like x equals 3, notice I have cosine of pi over 3, which is cosine of 60 degrees, which is equal to positive 1 half, but I have something positive times something negative, which would work out to something negative here. So we'll just make ourselves some space, and then we'll write our conclusion based on this. So now we have to think about how this conclusion helps us with our question. Well, what this tells us is that if f of x is decreasing on 2 to infinity, that tells us that our sequence b sub n sine of pi over n is eventually decreasing forever. So we could say that b sub n sine of pi over n is a decreasing sequence. So from here, we can make the leap. Therefore, sine of pi over n, this is a decreasing sequence. And if we have a decreasing sequence on top of having a limit going to zero, that tells us by the alternating series test that our original series converges.